Fox News. One minute. WPTV First Alert Weather on WSTU is brought to you by Code Red Roofers. Code Red Roofers cares and calls you back, shows up, and finishes on time. 287-2829. Code Red Roofers, the roofers who respond. Now here's the First Alert Meteorologist. Your WPTV first alert forecast. This afternoon, highs in the low 80s, some passing clouds, but clouds should remain rain-free throughout the day. Tomorrow through Saturday, high pressure dominates, keeping our weather pattern quiet. Highs in the low 80s with only a slim chance for an isolated shower. Sunday, staying warm with highs in the low 80s, a few more showers possible ahead of a cold front. Cold front moves in on Monday, highs down in the mid to upper 70s for Monday and Tuesday. I'm WPTV first alert meteorologist Katya Hall for WPTV. WSTU 1450, Martin County's Heritage Station. You are listening to WSTU, Stewart, Jensen Beach, Hope Sound, Martin County's Heritage Station. It's time now for the Casey Ingram Show on WSTU. The opinions expressed are those of the program host and guest and not necessarily those of WSTU. WSTU does not endorse products that may be mentioned. Any reproduction or retransmission of this broadcast is strictly prohibited without written consent of WSTU. It's time to call in with your questions and comments at 220-9788, 220-WSTU. And now, here's Casey Ingram. Good morning. Good morning and welcome back. Another beautiful Wednesday here on the Treasure Coast. I always sound like a broken record because it's almost always sunny and beautiful here. I just love it. And can't we have, it. you can't beat it. And uh, another great show on tap. We have our try to get him in here every month. We have Yay. Eric Miller from Talk About Martin. And thank you for having me back. And no shot collar today. <laughs> I, I, I promise I'll tone it down from last month a little bit. But man, was I passionate about the, the stuff going on in Indian Town. It's good that people are passionate, you though. Will. And you know what, uh, Eric, we love because you, you're honest, it comes from the heart. So it's it's like somebody's got to say it and you do. And I'll tell you what, it's <laughs> you don't Citizens have to, voice, man. You don't have to wonder matters. what Eric's thinking. Your and voice matters. Make it louder. 100, 100%. If you don't voice yourself, then you have no reason to complain. So yep. Um, but ahead of today's show, uh, let's talk about forbearances, working remotely, internet shopping, retail space, and rental income have been hit hard by COVID. If you're looking to restructure your debt, obtain financing or equity, Commercial Mortgage can help you out. Tim Mullen at Commercial Mortgage has been providing debt restructuring services since 2003. Tim never charges a front fee and all consultations are free. Tim only gets paid if he provides you a debt workout. Looking for a debt solution or financing? Give Tim a call at 772-872-6. 6099 or visit commercial mortgage LLC Dot com to schedule your free consultation. Also, everybody, it's such a fun place here in Martin County, and that's the Fish House Art Center. It's right down in the pocket in Port Salerno. Um, I can't tell you enough just to, if you're looking for something to do on the weekend, during the week, doesn't matter. It's a fun place to go and visit. Um, you can come by boat. You can come by car. You can stroll the boardwalk. Uh, Fish House Art Center, there's so much around there. There's an art gallery, Airbnb, boat charters, marina, craft and creamery, craft beers and wine and 24 flavors of ice cream so there is something for everybody adults and the kids and you can find all of that at the fish house art center you can check them out online ahead of time the fish house art center.com if you have a question 221-5482 and finally indian town marina it is south florida's best boating storage facilities um so much is great out there but uh, one thing that I want you to start thinking about and I hate to say it but it's gonna be hurricane season before you know it and the biggest part about that is you want to make sure you have safe harborage for your boats these things are as you a boat owner knows they are not cheap so um, you need a safe place to keep them I can't think of a better place than Indian Town Marina and it's really smart to go out there and at least make your reservations so when a hurricane happens you know you have a place and I can tell you folks when a hurricane is named trying to find a spot then is usually too late because people are making their reservations now you're guaranteed to have a spot and you can do that in Indian, Indian Town Marina 772-631-3272 and it's also a do-it-yourself or a full-service boat yard so you can do all kinds of work on your boat while you're out there electrical mechanical bottom painting just everything you can think of so that's indian town marina give them a call 631-3272 and folks we got a great show on tap today we're going to be talking about bright line bridge the school board um comp plan vote uh that happened yesterday i watched the commission meeting that was a very lengthy discussion 
And uh, a, a lot of great updates. Insider trading, there's some great updates that have happened since the last show. But I want you to... Uh, Tune in next week if you can. Um, I'm going to have a special guest. His name is Michael Yan, and he is a combat correspondent, has uh, over 20 years' experience, travels the world, and he is coming on the show to talk about um, what he calls the Pantha War. And it has very little coverage in the media, but he is very concerned about famine. And he said he's studied a lot of pandemics. Um, many times they come together, like in World War One pandemic notice anything war. about and he is absolutely convinced that you need to be concerned about this famine this is going to be different this time usually it's pockets around the world oh, yeah this time it's going to be a worldwide it's famine hit the home front it's, they're already projecting on the corn futures for next year 40 percent of our regular corn crop will be coming in 40 percent we will be 60 percent down and the reason is a shortage of fertilizers that's right because of the farming methods that we've taken in a large agri-corporate environment we tear the soil up we tear the nutrients out and then we throw fake chemicals on top so the soil's dead and without the chemicals they're not growing corn maybe in iowa right but, but it, it is the the fertilizer shortage is a, a real thing folks and it it's it's not only the only thing we have the pandemic that's happened but this the supply chain shortage you start putting all inflation. these things together inflation Ukraine. um China's already stacked up half of the world's food resources yes, in anticipation of a famine. So yep. this is a real thing that people are talking about. And so this is going to be a super good show. Wow, and I'm looking forward to that one, Casey. Eric, That's yeah. going to be a good show, well, a real good show. As today and then next week, I hope you uh, either call into the studio, which you can do at 220-WSTU. That's 220-9788. And uh, certainly we can uh, take your questions or comments. And I'm always watching my Facebook live feed as well. And uh, Tony Stevens, my foghat guy over in the UK. Hey, how you doing? I'm glad you're to uh, slow ride, Tony. Yeah, slow, slow ride, baby. Ride, baby. Uh, he is tuning in from the UK, and Tony, even the famine, he's talking about a worldwide famine. So this is going to be a show that everybody's going to want to tune into yep. next week. But let's um, let's talk a little bit local here. Um, yesterday, the Martin County Board of uh, Commissioners had a um, vote on a transmittal for a couple of um, comprehensive plan amendments. And actually, they're tied together. Uh, one is a, a um, the, the amendment is for a plan called Atlantic Fields, and it's down in uh, Hope Sound off Bridge Road. It would include 317 homes on fewer than 420 acres of land. The remainder of the 2,300-acre land holdings would be dedicated to permanent recreation, agricultural preservation, and open space conservation. Upon completion, it's estimated the small community of luxury homes will produce nearly $20 million in net tax revenue for Martin County each year. However, to do this, they're asking for a comp plan amendment and basically what that does is that land is zoned right now for one unit for 20 acres this would change that certain agricultural land units to be one unit for five acres so that's how they can get more homes on there but then they're dedicating more of the land for preservation so it's Really, it had only a couple supporters in the commission meeting yesterday. But um, I'm going to try and host a, a show here in the future showing both sides of this comp plan amendment and so folks so that you can decide. But long story short, the commission did vote 3-2 to two to um, transmit these the comp plan amendments to the state. And just to give you an idea, the local planning agency heard it on January 20. They voted for in a 4-0 to, to recommend the approval. The county commission voted to transmit it three to two yesterday, and then the next time it's going to come back um, to the board after the state looks at it, it'll be for them to approve it or not. Now, what happened in the meeting yesterday, and the two that uh, opposed it were Commissioner Hurd and Commissioner Hetherington. So Commissioner Smith, Campion, Jenkins voted yes, but with that, they said we need more public comment and. Commissioner Hetherington was very clear about this. She said, I, I can't support this because there hasn't been enough public comment and opportunity for the public to, to weigh in on this. So um, Smith, Jenkins, and Campy all said, we need to have more public comment. They're going to work with the Guardians of Martin County to host some um, meetings so that the public can have their input and listen more about these comp plan amendments because people are very concerned. And, you know, one good question is, why is this a big, broad paint 
you know, stroke of paint uh, with a paintbrush, why isn't it just applying to this one particular project? And there's probably lawsuits as an answer to that, you know, if somebody is approved and another one isn't. But but people had some really good questions that need to be answered. So there are going to be some public meetings before it comes back to the board. And that's probably going to be in about, we think, 60 days or so. And I understand the need for growth. Uh, you, you know, a tomato rots on the vine if it doesn't uh, continue to grow. But I, I, coming in here, it takes me almost 50 minutes to get from Indian Town to the studio in downtown Stewart. And the number of lights that I sit through and waste my time at sitting there trying to keep my blood pressure down before I come on the show is incredible. <laughs> I mean, you I take Monterey you. and you. US-1. What, what do they plan on doing as they continue to allow this kind of you know, density to come into, uh, into Martin County? Where, our infrastructure, road infrastructure, just is not there to deal with it at this point. Eric, people brought that up in the meeting yesterday during public comment. That's a huge concern for everybody right now. You know, you're waiting through three lights during times where you're used to waiting just for one light. Right. Um, and the, the amount of traffic that our roads are now taking is, is really... Uh, increased. It's insane. It, it is. It's insane. And people see that. And then you're bringing in more development. Obviously, it's more traffic. So all these questions need to be addressed. And, and people are very concerned about this amendment. So I, I think always public input is Yeah, it does seem priority. like they moved that through pretty quick, didn't it? That was the, the biggest complaint. I mean, January 20th, the LPA... And now all of a sudden it was at the Board of County Commission, you know, one month later and no public They're meetings in between. taking cues from the village of Indian Town because they like to do things back to back every couple of days without much public comment without or public time comment. for people to form an opinion. They just set the narrative. I, I guess they're taking cues from Indian Town now. It seems like it. It seems like the, the quicker you can push things things through, it doesn't give the public the wow. opportunity to have, you know. But they, they are going to now. People are paying attention The public either, did, so, uh, you know. know, they came out and I'll tell you, they were paying attention yesterday, though. That Good. room was packed and uh, the commission listened to every well, one of the congratulations, people Congratulations, Martin talk. County. Yes. They, that's good to hear. Yes. It's, that's good uh, to hear. It's good. People need to get involved. And, and they had some good questions and the traffic concerns was just one of many. So, well, you know, most people, like we've told them before, can watch the meetings online live or even in replay. Which is what I did yesterday. And you can. You can replay it. It's on YouTube. YouTube, it's on Facebook, it's on uh, the county uh, MCTV, so right, right on Martin County Commission website. There's many ways to participate and, of course, email the uh, commissioners as well and give them your opinion. So it's super important to get involved. And it when it comes to the comp plan, um, and by the way, uh, we lost a, a real legend on the comp plan here this past weekend, Maggie Herchella. Yeah, I I, I'm sure you saw that. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was one that had voiced her opinion about this comp plan amendment, of course, because she was one of the uh, original architects of the comp plan. And it's right. just something that, you know, it, it guides our county and guides our growth so um this th there was a lot of uh, people that recognized her efforts uh in this the meeting yesterday as well so well, this demonstrates why why it's important that people practice something called observational awareness you know we learned it really hard in the military you had to be observant of what was going on around you or you're going to end up dead and to kind of put that back into civilian terms, you know, we drive cars at 75 miles an hour, no more than 100 inches from large semis and dump trucks coming at us. How is it that we're all able to do that for hundreds of thousands of miles with no problems? It's because we practice something called observational awareness. We observe the surroundings around us. We react. We make ourselves work in the way that keeps us safe. So why is it that most people don't take the time to apply observational awareness to other things? that have direct impact to their life, like right. the policy makers around them that are putting things together. And it, the time to do that is during the process, not after Funny the process. Funny you say that, Eric, because, you know, one of the, the issues we're looking at right now is the Bright Line Bridge. Um, this is something that the community um, at one time uh, – and I was, I was very much part of it, uh, started Florida Not All Board, but we raised our voices up and opposed it, and, and – as it turned out, um, there's really not a lot of opposition now. It's the, the train went through. They're they're working on expanding it, and now there's people up in arms saying, "Oh my God, how you know how can we do this? How can we stop it?" And folks, the you time has passed. <laughs> it's passed. The time to oppose it was you know six years ago, seven years ago, when there was hundreds and thousands of people. Yep. I took I took over sixty five thousand signatures up to Washington D.C. of people that oppose this project up and down the Treasure Coast. That was the time to oppose it. But you know when you wait till things are approved and passed, um, there's 
you know, your, your hands are tied now. And honestly, I mean, our, our Board of County Commissioners on a vote of four to one voted to um, settle a lawsuit that Martin County had started, not the train. We had started against them to try and um, protect our interest. And they voted to settle that lawsuit with Brightline. And in doing so, um, they they couldn't meet with opposition. They can't oppose the train. So they really silenced our voices, in my yep. opinion, when they did that. And um, that was a four to one vote. Uh, Sarah Heard voted against that. And um, I was at that meeting. It was one of those quick meetings, Eric, that we talked about, honestly. I'll never forget it. It was the Saturday after Thanksgiving. How many times does the wow. Board of County Commissioners meet on the Saturday after Thanksgiving? Oh, always. Yeah. Always, yeah. Special meeting. <laughs> and uh, they did Are it and, and voted to uh, end, end that uh, lawsuit, which was almost to the end anyway wow. it, it really it, it wanted it, they and they also agreed to pay for half a station if if brightline decides to build it in martin county without any idea how much that's going to cost so you know this is what happens if you don't pay attention though folks and you just said it you you need to get involved early on you can't wait till something's already approved and passed yeah the things you're seeing come to fruition now started 10 years ago right. in the development process and the planning process and then uh, uh, you know at least two or three years ago in terms of the approval process right. through the government so well you, you have to keep your eye on the ball Brightline originally wanted to be running from Miami to Orlando in 2014 that tells you how long this thing's been in the wow. in the process so obviously that didn't happen and they still haven't made it to Orlando which they're getting close uh, they are they're uh, predicting it'll be next year 2023 and it's going to change the face and with the Brightline bridge you know um, this was typical of all board Florida Brightline they were called virgin trains they've been called so many things it's hard to keep up but you know they'd make promises and not keep them and uh, right now they uh, TC Palm reported they're not going to replace the St. Lucie bridge uh, the current plans are for the bridge openings and closings to be equally divided between rail and marine traffic during the four hour periods from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. according to the 2018 Brightline settlement with Martin County the bridge will be required to be open at least 15 consecutive minutes per hour during those times wow. folks the bridge 15 minutes now I'm a boater. I've been through that bridge many times. The current is enormous there. And typically any size of boat, unless it's very small, only one boat can go through at a time. Yeah. So if you have this thing closed for 45 minutes out of the hour, to have boats on both sides of that bridge trying to get through in 15 minutes, it'll never happen. I mean, if you're west of the bridge, folks, I, I, I'm sorry, we tried, you know. It's, it's something that um, I, I can't believe they over you know this was just kind of overlooked and and that's that so well it's making indian town look better all the time it is you want to <laughs> see that that marina out there is good so that's right <laughs> um right now the bridge's clearance is six and a half feet above me uh uh, mean high tide so you know anybody with a center console that's a t-top you're, you're just gonna have to wait so that's 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 it. And, you know, when it comes to Brightline, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that because uh, just south of us, there are so many deaths. This is the deadliest train in America. And if if you can get ready to cue a video, I'm not ready for it quite yet, uh, Ray, but in a second, people are calling all these people, they're stupid, they're idiots, they're this and that for for getting hit by the train but folks there's something that is not reported and that really needs to be pointed out why is this the deadliest train in america well i'll tell you why um, there are more than 300 railroad crossings in the tri-county region populated by six million people and that's grade level crossings and this is the problem other trains don't have this many grade level crossings and ray if you can go ahead and play that video and then we'll talk a little more about this Notice anything Notice about, about high-speed trains? High trains? None of them cross roads at street level, or what's called at grade, a bridge over or tunnel under streets. In heavily populated areas, most have fences and other barriers along their tracks. This is typical of high-speed rail worldwide. All aboard Florida will cross more than 340 streets at grade level from Miami to Orlando reaching speeds up to 110 miles per hour. Ripping through our towns on the Treasure and Space Coasts, they will increase the chance of accidents and deaths by 300%. Amtrak's express train, Acela, crosses only 11 streets at grade on its entire route from Boston to New York to Washington, D.C. 
Acre, Acela, the express train. There's only 11 grade crossings between Boston and Washington, D.C. We have over 340. And uh, in 2014, the lead FRA engineer, Frank Frey, stated, quote, trespassing is an epidemic on this corridor, the Florida East Coast Railway corridor. But since the speed is not 125 miles per hour, the standard high-speed rail safety features are not required. So that's why the train's only going to go up to 110 miles per hour, because they don't have to worry about safety features. Folks, that costs money. And, uh, you know, that's that's what we have coming here. And I, I have to point out, um, I was looking through some of my notes, and this, this was from October 2014, and I had a couple researchers, Jeff Ream and Pete Bullock, that examined the highway safety statistics and the last 15 years of FEC safety record. Folks, this was 2014, and I want you to think, these guys were extrapolating. The Bright Line had not started yet. They were extrapolating information, and it's it's unbelievable how close they were with the numbers that they reported back in 2014 because all aboard Florida Brightline stated this trans quote this transportation service would offer a safe and efficient alternative to automobile travel on congested highway quarters mm -hmm. they said this isn't true it isn't safe what they figured out is that Florida interstate highway fatality is 1.28 fatalities per 100 million vehicles and they also estimated that Brightline would kill uh, approximately 36 people a year. Now, it has killed uh, 57 people since it, since it started running in 2017, but it suspended operations for almost two years with COVID. So they're at 23 people per year. But the difference between those numbers are um, Jeff Ream and Pete Bullock said from Orlando to Miami it would be about 30, 37 yeah. people. So, um Who's going to pick up the difference? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, Good Lord. It's, it's horrible. It's horrible. And, you know, people don't realize that these grade level crossings, and this is where people are getting hit. There's no sealed corridors. Other trains have done the right things to put the safety procedures and put the safety equipment in place where this one, it doesn't have to. It's not going over 110 miles or 125 miles per hour. So, you know, Unintended consequences. Unintended I guess. consequences. And then um, I also have an email from um, Robert Ledoux that was forwarded back to me in 2014 as well. They were talking about freight trains because people were uh, concerned about how long and how many trains. And we are too here. Our bridge has broken down here in Stewart and we had a freight train. You know, we actually have a Facebook page quarters. called Talk About the Train. The really? four, yeah, Talk About the Train. And it's um, Indian Town. Booker Park, uh, the south side of the village of indian town is indians town indian towns cut through by 710 you have a, a bound of houses to each side of 710 you also have the rail that parallels 710 as you're going through indian town and that rail cuts off everybody to the south there's only three entrances to that but it's a seven to ten mile right. stretch to find the next entrance and the train sits there for an hour, hour and 40 minutes. We've documented it a hundred times and cuts off the urban core blocking two of the three. But they can do that because they're only blocking two of the three because people still have a way in. But it's affected emergency services, all sorts of things. It's a huge the concern. Rail, the rail companies are nobody to mess with. They're quiet little giants that carry big sticks. You they want to be truly careful. Do. With, oh, yeah, they truly they, do. And I, I want to say with the freight trains, uh, that was a huge issue with Tequesta, which shut down the town and emergency vehicles couldn't get through because right. uh, they would have bridge issues. But uh, Mr. Ledoux said uh, the FECR will continue to increase our train length to maximize to 14,000 feet before they add more trains. So 14,000 feet long trains. You want to know what that is? 2.65 miles. So you know, and obviously they're going to add boxcars before they add trains because it's cheaper. Wow. So, you know, you think about that and then combine that with the uh, Brightline trains going 32 trips a day. That's it, It's going to be a huge impact, folks. And um, I'm going to have uh, Mayor Matheson in from the city of Stewart. I know he was uh, quoted in the paper of saying, you know, this bridge needs to be upgraded. It needs to be replaced. Well, maybe we so. should quit playing with all of these woke little programs Ugh. like painting the street green in front of the Lowe's on US-1 and put some of that hundreds of thousands of street painting dollars towards solving some traffic issues. And it's it now huge. sounds like we're going to have train issues as well. Right. I mean, there could be blood on people's hands right. for doing what they've done to allow this to go through. Literally, when people die, I would not want to be that commissioner that sat there and voted to let this go, knowing that I was the one that approved it. 
and Good can't Lord. say anything now about anything negative. I mean, it's where's the spine? Where is everybody's spine at this point? Why is it? Why is it always they get backed into a corner and they'll give you a hundred excuses as to why they had to do something? You know what? What's the problem with standing on principle and merit anymore? Why? Where it's, are you? Where are these people? Why are we not electing yeah. people that will stand on principle yeah. and merit? You, you really need to. And I, I remember with that meeting, it's it's been a few years, but I remember it because I fought so hard for our community and for our county and, and for the Treasure Coast. I mean, we had um, people from Broward down to Miami-Dade that had uh, opposed and signed petitions and wow. signed resolutions. There was such a huge amount of uh, people. And uh, we, we fought so hard. And, and I sat there in that commission meeting, and, and one of the, you know, one of the rules of, of the settlement was to be silenced. I'm like, you work for us. How 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 yeah. can our elected officials agree to no longer represent us? Well, you know, and that's these high-speed rails it. never make money either. No. They There's, lose there, money. There are it's no like profitable mass transit. High-speed they trains. lose money. Right now, I, I saw a comment in, in one of the papers. So why one of the are they folks. doing it? Well, there's, I'm going to pull a Joe Biden onion yeah. whisper. Why are they doing it? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. The Joe Biden whisper. It all comes I, about yeah, money. And, I, I, and honestly, you know, we fought tax dollars for this train, but now they're they're getting so many tax dollars. It's ridiculous. It's um, just putting money in somebody's pocket. Just like, well, Martin County, we're probably going to be paying for half that station if they build it here. I can't imagine why they wouldn't. So. Well, it's a perfect example as to, again, why we have to get involved. And today, if, if, if do you have more? No, go no, ahead. Let's say, go. It, today, there's actually a vote uh, in the uh, House, and uh, the so let's see here. It says uh, 22nd, 23rd. That's today. Yes. House and Senate of Florida. Uh, they're going to consider House Bill 105 and Senate Bill 224, regulation of smoking. Now, these bills remove the 37-year-old state mm-hmm. preemption of smoking regulations, and it will allow all counties and municipalities to uh, regulate smoking as they see fit on their public parks and beaches. These bills are highly prized by local government by their ability to allow the abolition of smoking in public spaces. So all these set-aside lands that we have, if you're a smoker, you are like an unvaccinated person now. You are in the wrong crowd. You are with the segregated (laughs) over here. You are not welcome to come onto our property if you are smoking. These bills are highly prized by local government for their ability to to allow the abolition of smoking. They've tried to do it in the past. Martin County actually tried to do this in the past, and the state said, no, sorry, we have preemption. The state has authority over that. You can't preempt us because we already have rule over that. Um, And I want to tell you what I'm reading from here. This comes from an individual that got involved ahead of the process. I'm not going to mention his name because I didn't ask him if I could use his name in this, but I know that he is a cigar aficionado. Um, I know he knows who I am, too, and that's okay. Um, He is also one that practices situational awareness when it comes to his governance. So when he saw this coming across the radar, and it's been out there for a good four to five months, I've been following this because Joe Gruder's Chuck E. Cheese, the RPOF chairman, um, is the one that's that's putting this forward. And uh, Randy Fine, actually, is uh, co-sponsoring this, too. Mm -hmm. Um, he got involved and he went up there, okay, and he lobbied. He talked to the senators. He talked to the bill sponsors. He said, look, man, I smoke cigars. He said, look at these things. They're all tobacco. You put them in, the, in there, they're going to degrade and they're going to go away. You're not going to have your nasty little cigarette butts left. Okay, I guess, but... You know, here again, you've got government that I'm, – I'm torn on this because I like the idea of local control. The more things you can have at local control, right. the government should be the most restrictive closest to you because the people are closest to those people right. making those decisions. Right. So I'm a little torn on it, but at the same time, it's public land that's being financed by public dollar. Smoking is not illegal. You can prevent illegal things from taking place, but why something that's not illegal you may consider it immoral? Because I don't want to put my hands or toes in the sand and feel a cigarette butt when I walk by. Well, you don't want tar from the ocean when it comes on your feet either. So this is a perfect example. They got a carve out in the bill for cigars. Now, it won't be your plastic tip cigars. Right. But they got involved early in the process as citizens. They contacted their leg- – and he goes on to talk in here about, folks, contact your legislators. Get involved. And that is the way the process is supposed to work, up front, not 
after the fact, like with Brightline, people screaming about, what do you mean Brightline's too coming late. through here? Yeah. Well, it's too late. Where yep. were you and the rest of us were out there standing on right. street corners and going and talking to the politicians right. behind doors and trying not to get this done? You have to do so it ahead of time, just like you, you said right here. to get involved. This in is a great example, Eric. This gentleman went up there. He knew that bill. He was obviously very tuned into what was going on in Tallahassee that concerned his business and his livelihood. Yep. And he went in ahead of time and obviously made common sense that they wrote a carve out, at least for his cigars that don't have the plastic tips. That's so. the way the system is supposed to work. If there were enough people that actually were paying attention that smoked that went to the beach, okay, right. that knew about this, they may have gotten in touch with their ledger, with, with Campo, and said, dude, you vote for this, next time you're done. Right, okay? right, right. I don't know that he got any calls on it. It'd be interesting to find out if he did. But, you know, next time you go to the beach and you see that the Martin County Commission now has, and Stewart, Stewart put... Uh, um, what's he going to say here? He said, for all my local, here he says, he says, for all my local friends, remember that just a short year and a half ago, the Martin County Commission attempted smoking regulations that had been rescinded because they were in breach of the state's preemption. As recently as the last meeting of the city of Stewart, discussion we had about the bill and a resolution of support from the city was written, support was written to, to be delivered to the state delegation in Tallahassee. There's no question if this measure passes the, the state house, there will be a considerable growth of regulation against tobacco enthusiasts on our public funded lands here in Martin County. So, you know, good for him for being involved. Good for him to know that it, it, That's right. you can still make a difference. And, you know, you can't feel beaten down once this train comes through because it came through. You weren't there in the beginning. Now keep your eye on the ball for other stuff coming up because there's right. plenty coming down the pipe that people are going to want to be looking at. Yeah, there, there are, you know, when it comes back to the train, I got a couple comments here uh, that I'll read here in a second. But, you know, one of the other articles I saw that surprised me was the uh, the quiet zones. You know, everybody advocated because the horn is very annoying. It, it truly is. It's very loud. But now they're going, maybe that's a mistake. Maybe that's why so many people are getting hit because mm -hmm. it's a quiet zone. And that is one of the issues that's brought up with quiet zones. It's it's a payoff. I mean, you got a quiet train, but now you got less people that are aware it's coming. It's... Uh, you know, it, there's a lot of things to be discussed. Why was it? What was their rationale in this whole thing? The government's rationale that they could not require them to build overgrade passes for these if they were going to do it. This company wanted to do this. They should foot the bill. And, and to say that there's an estimate of 32 deaths per year, when do 32 deaths become inconsequential in passing a law and letting people drive a train at high speeds and kill 32 people? What is the purpose of something that doesn't make money? What, why? I know. I, I, I couldn't this, agree with you more. This whole thing is corrupt um, beyond it, it, belief. Well, and it's, you know, All Aboard Florida, and I, this is bright line, folks, for those of you that don't know, it was All Aboard Florida to begin with. Um, you know, they came into town and they said, we own the land, we own the tracks, and we're going to do what we want. And that's what they are doing. And, you know, when it comes to all these grade crossings, it's, it's, it is. It is. It, bottom line. Bottom line. We own, land, we own the tracks. We're going to do what we want. And they did. <laughs> um, you know, we have to pay to maintain and um, upgrade any of the crossings because we have to lease our roads to go across their train tracks. So it's it's very convoluted. Oh, they're big giants. They're they are. quiet giants. You can't sue them for accidents. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, my, my question is this. You know, and, and just like now, the uh, Jensen Beach uh, crossing is yes cl closed. closed and I know that from my other uh, situation that I do but I can tell you that if the businesses got together you know with all the money uh, they're going to lose because of the improvements quote end quote that they're doing to the tracks this would have been a whole different story it's not you know it's not just the individuals that live in the county businesses too need to step forward and Absolutely. say hey is this going to help my business or is this going to hurt me and right now i know that the uh, a lot of businesses especially you know like mulligans right, all right? we had them on the air uh, a cut from our news partner wptv channel five yes okay and he was saying you know hey they have to go all the way around this could deter somebody to come to my restaurant 100%. and they're not the only restaurant that's saying that or club that's okay. that's right. So it's just something to consider here. You know, it's not just the individuals that need to step forward. 
Ray, it's a very, very good point. And, you know, one of the things, uh, um, as when I was opposing the train and we spoke to a lot of businesses, there were a lot of businesses that opposed it at the time. But there were also some that said, gee, a train's great. It'll, people from Miami is going to come to Stewart to shop. <laughs> you know what I'm seeing? People from Stewart going, train's going to be great. I can go to Miami and shop now. <laughs> Because there's a lot more to find in stores down in Miami than there are here in Stewart. Yeah, let's go spend the day partying in Miami. Yeah. Let's go up to Universal for you the know, day. I'd, I'd be concerned about the reverse happening. Oh, so. yeah. We're not really a destination spot. And, and uh, Kim, you're right. She said the, the train's just going to add to the traffic issues. And Brent Wahlberg, uh, bars, bars line the railroad track. A few years back, three young ladies and a young man may have had a little too much to drink and were caught on Turkey Creek Railroad Bridge in Melbourne with a train barreling down at a blistering speed of 45 miles per hour. The young man jumped and survived. The ladies were grounded, were, were killed. What they need is real media coverage and not a media that sugarcoats everything in favor of those who have the big bucks. And amen to that, Brent. Yep. And that's exactly what's going on. They just want to blame the people. And it's amazing. The suicides are just with Brightline. I mean, when Brightline was closed down, the suicides quit. They didn't go over to Tri-Rail. It just stopped. It's just incredible to me. Something you just pointed out. The number one tourist destination, okay, for many years in the world was Orlando, Florida. So, like you said, that's taking away uh, profits from the Treasure Coast. Right. Going to other places. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Yep. So, uh, it's going to be a lot of lot of things that are going to fall out more on this. But, you know, Eric, our hour's really flying by, and I know you had some oh. uh, school boards uh, issues we want to talk yeah, about, too. Yeah, let's keep our eye on the ball with this one again. There's there's buzz out there. I saw a real quick story about how the school board's actually considering asking for an extension of the uh, referendum, the sales tax referendum. That These did. were the ones from, was it 2018? Is that about yeah, right? Yeah, 2018, it was... Um, Four million dollars a year, I believe. There were two referendums year. that year. One was to That's increase right. teacher salary, as I recall. Help me remember. Oh, the other one. Oh yeah, one one was for teacher salary, and the the other one was kind infrastructure, of infrastructure. Infrastructure, kind building. of non sequitur. It was okay. it was you know a smaller one. It was shorter lived, and it 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 was it was understandable. Teach teach teachers. I love you, teachers. Um, Giving the sales tax to the teachers for their salaries was the way this thing was pitched. It was the way it was written. It as was intended, well. right? Right. And after the fact, the the union started getting involved in the negotiations, and they changed things from teachers to union positions and union blocks, and they started chopping things up without labels. And before you know it, janitors and non-teaching people were getting well over a million dollars of that four million dollar a year stipend that was going out, but it was going out quietly under the auspice and guise of uh, committee work that was taking place out of really out of the public eye, obscure committees. So when 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 pushed on that, they um, they still went through with it, and they they kept the the monies in the hands of the uh, non-teaching personnel, and now they want to extend it again. I mean. I, I, for one, don't like the fact that you are, that they, uh, our system allows for non-property owners to be able to vote to raise a tax on a property mm -hmm. owner, mm -hmm. okay? What do they care? Right. What do they care? You should have to prove ownership of uh, property, be it commercial and or residential mm -hmm. in Martin County, to be able to vote on that referendum. That should be your allowed a group of people. But what about the argument, I'm a renter, they're just going to raise my rent if the taxes are paid, so they do have a stake. They'll raise my rent if the taxes are paid. They, uh, Raised. You know, they have to pass that cost on to the renter, so the renter does have a stake even if they're not a property owner. Correct. They do, I guess, at a certain point. At a certain point, they do. But right. Anyway, I just, I don't... Uh, I don't see another referendum being what needs to take place here. There's obviously something going on uh, that is less than honorable in that system. It seems very toxic. Um, you know, even Anthony George, the attorney for the school board at the time, stepped around a whole lot of stuff in their follow-up. And when they started getting exposed through Talk About Martin and through, through uh, an individual that helped us with the story from Martin County Parents United, uh, 
they started tap dancing and you should hear some of the reasoning that they came up with stuff it's like are you kidding me this is i'm not an attorney and even i know that that doesn't make sense so I don't know. I, I, I just keep your eye on the ball, folks. You have to keep your eye on the ball. And how do you do that? Well, you you look for the meetings. There, there's a right. whole list of meetings. Board of County Commissioners, State of the County Address is coming up. You want to know where your county's at? Febu- uh, February 24th at 9 a.m. Tomorrow. Palm City, New Hope. That's tomorrow. State of the County Address coming up. Uh, you can also get tomorrow... Let's see. There's another big one. Uh, Lifeline. You know they got a new Lifeline helicopter. I did the see that. Hawk. I did now, see this that. This is a good, good department. expenditure, of taxpayer money, if you ask me. Um, I haven't been trauma hawked out yet, but knowing me, I'll. Get there one <laughs> it might happen. Life Star ceremony, um, February 24th at 2 p.m., and that's at the Life Star hangar. So here's a chance to meet your commissioners, find out who they are, talk to them say hi, get a card so you can call them. You have a list of meetings, committees that you can serve on, things that are going on around you that affect you that if you don't pay attention, keep your mouth shut, will you? You know, I couldn't agree with you more. And honestly, you know, these commissioners, they, they've all, they're very open. They're willing to speak with you. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, they're, they're in a tough spot. They have to make decisions. And honestly, your voice does make a difference with them. If you don't let them know how you feel, then they, they assume. And they, you know, they have other people in their ears as well. They're, they're, you're, they're people. They're going to be influenced by really oftentimes the loudest. Yep. And so if you're quiet. Well, we've you talked know. about this before too, Casey. This might be something that could help. And this is where I make my call to all those good people that are out there that say to me, what can one individual do? There is a way that we can dynamically change the political structure of Martin County, and it's done legitimately and under Florida statute. There are two ways that we can elect our county commissioners. One is the way that we're doing it right now with five at-large commissioners um, that somebody in Jensen Beach votes for the Indian town, the, you know, the western Martin County. They, they, you've got somebody in Jensen voting for, for, right. for Hope Sound crazy where our population is getting large enough but yet that now. commissioner has to live in that district that's in jensen but yeah but indian town's voting or vice versa yeah, yeah. you have and to live in a certain district but the whole county votes yeah so it, why it doesn't not make a lot open of sense. it up to where we just do district votes and there is a second way we can do this it's seven commissioners there are five that are only elected within their own districts right Okay, so District 5 it is now. District 1, would only the people in there would vote for their district. So you're bringing it even closer. Now these people are having to make decisions with their immediate neighbors. Right, okay? right. Um, and then you still have the other two, which are the at-large that sit in an at-large position and are elected at-large. It's sort of a bigger check and balance in terms of the dynamic and the way things work. It gives you seven voices. It gives you sort of a House and Senate kind of approach. I was going to say, it reminds you of the way the state is set up. You have right. your, your governor, but then you have, you know, senators and representatives from districts, and only the people in the district they represent vote for them. And then the senators <laughs> represent the state. The, then they, they go to the state. That's right. And then they, they come yeah. together, each of their districts, where, you know, we're not voting on a senator or representative from Naples or from Tallahassee. We only vote on our own. And that that's basically what you're saying here this the is the kind of thing that it's going to take to bring these look we're not going to go back and undo bright line it's going to undo itself okay, yeah, okay. And, and unfortunately i think it's going to happen tragically right but we as good americans that are informed upstanding citizens people that are involved and want to make a difference and the individual that says what can i do well here's a chance to come together put all other differences aside and sit at a table and say our goal is to get a referendum placed on ballot to change the way we elect our local officials and shake this system up okay shake it up a bit let's get things even closer to home i think it's a really good idea eric i I really do add two commission seats and have each of the 
the commissioners represent their district. A ballot amendment in Martin County would take anywhere from a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to put together. That's chump change, considering when you look at what the commissioners actually raise in their war chests to get elected in this county. Oh, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars is just a starting number that That's you right. need. Now I still don't understand why you need that much money because there's a lot of different ways to get out and see people without spending it on right. advertising and signs. But hey. I, I mean, it's, it's basically the citizens would need to come up with a, um, a petition, right? That Correct. They would There's a process to you have to go through. You have to put specific language together, like the school board did that said it was going to pay teachers. And then after the fact, we could probably have nine c c uh, commissioners because, you know, we don't have to do what the referendum actually right. says. See, we would be held to a much higher standard. And there's a big degree of potential for lawsuit on the, the wording is just not right. That's discriminatory. Like, so you get a lot of pressure when you're putting this together. And it involves attorneys, and that's what takes a good deal of money. Right. It also involves people standing out in front of Publix that you hire at 10 to $15 an hour. and ask signatures. For, yeah, you've got to have a certain percentage of the county's registered vote sign this to get it on referendum so it's a it's an effort it would take money but at this point folks you either start taking your local government back uh, the federal government is good forget it man you, we have to deal with what we have at home first uh, Kim just uh, mentioned on Facebook I did I think I saw something but I didn't realize uh, this had happened, but the district, the school district, just opened up student enrollments to St. Lucie and Palm Beach County residents. If they increase taxes, we are funding non-residents of Martin County. What? So that's uh, that's a good point. I did see something on Facebook that they have opened up enrollment, which I think they have to under state law now. I, I, I believe that law passed um, in two years ago, I want to say 2020, where if there's room in the schools you have to open it up to anybody in the state. So you can have St. Lucie, you can have Palm Beach, and we can go there, vice versa, if there's a certain amount of room in the school available. And evidently there is if they've opened Geniuses. this up. Yep. But I, I don't believe this is a local rule, Kim. I think this was a state rule, and they have to. Unbelievable. And I know that they were doing votes uh, at the school board level of, of what that level was. So if it was 90% capacity, they were not going to accept. And don't take that figure to the to the bank. It, it may have been a different percentage, but a certain percentage, they will not let outside students in. But once it falls below that percentage, we have 80% capacity, they, they have to let them in. How does something like that not absolutely cause agita in a taxpayer? Oh, because I know. Kim's you know, right. Even, even our if, our even, taxes. Yeah, there are taxes. Even if you're going to allow these people to govern for you and you voted them in and you, you've given them the ability to do it, man, do you think with the size budget they have that if you don't keep an eye on them, there aren't going to be problems? This is the right. kind of stuff that they that takes place. They start thinking that they know better than everybody. The system gives them false choices. We've talked about that before. This system is set up to do nothing but deliver false choices to the people that are making the decisions because there's a central core of bureaucrats that are writing all of the things that have to be done. Here's your choices. A village manager right. in Indian Town, which by the way, Indian Town on a positive note, I participated in the Indian Town cleanup the other day. A, a, a couple of weeks back. What a day. We absolutely set records. Waste management says that corporate-wide and all of the city cleanups that they did, that we blew the wow. statistics out. Great we job, filled Indian dumpsters, oh. hazardous, tons of hazardous waste, tires. Fabulous. Um, Tony Z and I spent a good hour and a half cleaning up a yard of a disabled elderly woman that we had previously helped uh, get a roof on her house. Um, but she had overgrown maiden cane in the neighborhood and deposited a lot of things in there over time, and, and we cleaned that out. It was a very positive day uh, in Indian Town, and it was good to see. It was community-wide. That is wonderful. Hundreds there's of, there's hundreds so of much. people on a cold 40-degree day out picking up trash and helping those in need that needed need. This sounds like the good old days of Indian Town. That, that, it does, uh, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does. And, and the leader, the person that put this together is to be commended. Her name is Phyllis Brown. And um, Brown, her, her last name is Brown by marriage. Her maiden name is Waters. Okay. She is Thelma uh. Waters' daughter. And she's... In a position right now, I think that she would be an excellent leader in the Indian town community. I don't know a lot about her politics, but I know her as a person. And she is one of these genuine, God-fearing, not 
not holier than thou, just she understands God. She lives and walks the right path. Right. She's a good Christian woman. And her value system is such that Indian town needs it right now because there are some very self-righteous and pious people that are hypocritical uh, on that, that, that village council that need to be replaced that are taking Indian town in the wrong direction. And I would encourage Phyllis at every turn to consider running and not against Susan as her, as they say, her people are encouraging her to do. Um, she's getting a lot of pushback from, it's sad, from the black community, the Anthony Dowlings, mm -hmm. from the strong liberal Hispanic Marxist community like the Janets uh, Hernandezes and the, the Jackie Clarks that are militant, you know, in, the, in their own right to run against Susan so that we can take things back. Now, if that's not racist, I don't know what is, you know, right, you, right. you know, I, 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 it's, it's incredible. And, folks, and it's she's so being pressured that important. she has to support her people. Ugh. And I am just, I, I would not want to be in Phyllis's position right now, but I'm praying for her, and I, I hope you would too, because she is one of the right people for the right place at the right time. She is a leader. And when you're thinking about your voting, no matter where you're from, if it's Indian Town or elsewhere, some dissension on the board is good. It's various opinions. You, yeah. you know, if you don't have dissension, you're not going to have new ideas. Well, they just passed phase one of the, what, what's it? They spent $32,000 to try to figure out what it's going to cost them to build a city hall. Okay, and this is while, uh, here, let me show you this. This is the WTI crude. Now, this is what our host in the last hour was talking about, Mark Breckville. This is the cost of oil since Joe Biden got in office here on this end. This is where it's at now. It's Crazy. doubled. Yes, it's we up see to that at over the It's up to nearing $100 a barrel, which when you're a municipality, and you look at the cost of running your municipality and the taxes and regulations Everything and impositions you're putting on everybody, up. now is not the time to be full gun, full bore, build, 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 especially with building material costs going where they're going right now. You can't even get three-quarter inch tongue and groove flooring plywood. I can't get it locally. <laughs> it, is, it is crazy. It's crazy. Hey, Eric, real quick, I wanted to do an update. We don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but on our, our very own Treasure Coast trader, Brian Mast, mm. um, we've been talking about insider trading and folks, um, it's really heating up that over 76% of the public supports a ban, according to recent polling by Business Insider. They want to ban Congress from trading stocks. Um, Brian Mast, a representative Mast, uh, Unusual Whales, pointed out the top 10 trades in the House, best individual trades. Brian Mast ranked in number three at a 564% increase and also again at number seven at 340%. So the top 10 trades uh, our own Treasure Coast trader, uh, Representative uh, Brian Mast, uh, took two of those spots. And uh, since then, there's been a couple bills that have been introduced in Congress. Uh, we're going to follow them. Hopefully they get through. The first one is Senator Hawley, uh, Senate Bill 3505. Uh, he says, year after year, politicians somehow manage to outperform the market, buying and selling millions in stocks of companies they're supposed to be regulating. Wall Street and big tech work hand-in-hand -hand with elected officials to enrich each other at the expense of the country. Yep. Here's something we can do. Ban all members of Congress from trading stocks and force those who do not pay their proceeds to give it back to the American people. It's time to stop uh, turning a blind eye to Washington profiteering. And boy, can I agree could not agree with him more. Um, also, a Senator uh, John Ossoff, he's a Democrat in Georgia, introduced a, a similar version of that bill. So we have a Republican and Senator Hawley from Missouri, uh, Senator Ossoff in Georgia, and also in the House, we have a banning insider trading Congress Act that was uh, introduced by Representative Vicki Hartzler. She's a Republican from Missouri and co entered and two people joined her in uh, sponsoring that. Uh, Chris Smith from New Jersey, a Republican, and Chris Stewart, Republican from Utah. So Democrats and Republicans are responding to this and uh, it, insider. It looks like Ted Cruz could actually be the one to water this down because the bill right now that Warren's putting through with all of this uh, that looks like it's gaining steam, uh, wants to prevent spouses from trading as well. And his wife, but his wife works at staff. Goldman Sachs trading desk. Oh, that's what happens, folks. This is why we need to keep our eye on the ball. It should be spouses and it should be um, th their top staff. I mean, anybody has inside information and they're not saying you can't ha 
have stacks. They're saying, let somebody else. Put them in mutuals, broad-based mutuals, broad stroke, you know specific buys. Mutual because funds, two years before, that's right. Two years ago, right before the virus, Congress was briefed in a secret meeting about what was happening with the virus before the public was, so they knew how to deal with it. And what they do? They ran out of the briefing and went and started to dump stocks that's and right. buy others. And what did we do? We were blindsided we were, and lost we money. We had no idea. So, folks, uh, I wanted to cover that more. There's a lot of things happening, but know that there are some uh, bills that have been introduced, and this is really gaining some traction, and, and thank you to Unusual Whales for that. So next week, I uh, hope you can tune in. We're going to have Michael Yan. We're going to talk about uh, Panfor War. Famine. Great story. You bet. We'll see you next week at 10.